we've been working through the, the, the churches, the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, and what the Lord has to say to each one of them and how that applies to us, and God's been showing us so much, so much stuff, and uh, when I found out that, that Paul wasn't going to be here this morning and I, I started asking the Lord what he wanted me to speak on, the first thing I thought was what we just looked at Wednesday night. So if you were there Wednesday night, you got a little preview. But he showed me a few more. us this morning, Lord. Speak to us this morning. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, first of all, I want you to understand that all seven of these churches are real places. These are real churches with real pastors, with real people. They were all in Asia Minor, and if you, some of you have maps in the back of your Bible, and you're, you're able, in our group, we, I, I showed them where they could go back there and look, and they can find all seven of these cities, and they're kind of uh, almost triangular, circular type in motion, but more like a triangle. And as Jesus shares about each one of these cities, he goes from one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And of all seven of these, Thyatira, probably the smallest, probably the smallest, but definitely not the least among them as far as things that were going on, both good and bad. In verse 18 it says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into a great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, speak to us this morning in your word, Father you be lifted up today. Amen. First of all, as he writes to the angel of the church, we, we said several weeks ago when we looked at this, I just want to remind you that, that literally who he's speaking to is the overseer, the pastor of that church. He's speaking to the pastor, directly to the pastor of the church at Thyatira. Thyatira is, a, like I said, a little small city, one that was primarily known for production of a purple cloth. You might remember from the book of Acts that Lydia Lydia was from the city of Thyatira, and she was a seller of, of purple cloth, and that was, that was one of their main exports. They had a whole lot of things going on, not the least of which was this church, but there were lots of other temples belonging to foreign gods, lots of other horrible things happening, horrible practices happening, and Jesus is going to address those, but first... He says the words of the Son of God. He declared himself the Son of God right here. He declares himself the Son of God. Back in Revelation chapter 1, he referred to himself as the Son of Man, but now he says, I want you to understand this is deity that's speaking to you. This is literally, this is God that's speaking to you. The Son of God that's speaking to you. 
He declared his, his own deity and the authority with which he was speaking. And he said, who has eyes like flame of fire. Of course, we're not going to go back and read there, but in Revelation chapter 1, as John first has this vision, we read it about three, four weeks ago when I, when I was preaching before, but as John first has this vision, he goes through a description of what he saw. And in each one of the churches, as Jesus addresses that pastor for each one of the churches, he refers back to that picture, the one who's holding the seven stars in his right hand, the one who has a, a double-edged sword extending from his mouth, the one here, he says, with eyes like a flame of fire, with feet like burnished bronze, literally eyes that see. He's going to come back to that at the end, in the middle of this passage. He said he sees you, eyes that burn. That, that's... That's eyes of judgment. That's eyes of, of, of Christ that sees there's nothing, nothing is hidden from his sight. Does everybody know that? Anybody ever thought they hid something from God? Besides me, I'll raise my hand. You think you do. You think, oh, you know, you think you're keeping, nothing's hidden before him. You can hide it from me and I can hide it from you, but you can't hide it from him. He sees all. He sees all. Feet like burnished bronze, literally hardened, literally purified, solid, stable, where he stands. He first gives to the church an attaboy, and he praises them for some great things. He says, I know your works. I know your works. I see you, church at Thyatira. I see the good things that you're doing. I see your love. Your love. And remember back to the church at Ephesus when we were looking at several weeks back, that was the thing that he told them was they had left their first love. But he said, I see your love. In other words, you, you love God the Father with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You love your neighbor as yourself. I see your love. You're known for that. I want to give you a commendation for that. He also said, I see your faith. I see your faith. Listen, I pray that God sees our faith here. He wants to see your faith. I, I, I pray that one day, you know, we, we go through things like this, and I think, Lord, give us a building. And, it, and it's coming. It's in the works. We're waiting on more bids right now. And, the, and for whatever reason, it slowed down. I, I don't understand why, but I know this. He's more interested in the faith of mortal life than where we meet. He's more interested in whether or not we're growing in our faith, in our knowledge of him, in our trust of him than where we meet. He's more interested in that than whether or not we have air conditioning. He is. He is. Thank you for staying with me this morning. I know it's, I know it's warm, but thank you for staying. I, I really appreciate that. So he, com he commends them. I, I know your works. I know your love. I know your faith. And then he says, I know your service. I know how hard you work. I know the things that you're doing for me, the good things, and I know your patient endurance. And he, then he says something really important. I know that you've gotten better at this every week. In other words, I, he, he says, I know that, that where you're at now, it's further along than where you were. You, you keep growing in that. It was a tremendous commendation for this church, one that we would want to hear. But then he speaks something directly to them, and it's a disturbing fact. He says, but I have this against you. And any time we hear that as we study these churches, I have this against you, it, it's just a reminder of the fact that God sees us. Listen, he sees this church. He sees this pastor and all of our pastors. He sees this church. He cares about what's happening at More to Life with all of us. He also cares about you as an individual. He's going to speak all of that in this little passage. He, he's going to address the pastor. He's going to address the church. But then he's going to address individuals that have remained faithful and those that have strayed. So a, as the Lord looks at us, he sees us collectively, but he also sees us individually. Do you know that? And, and we have to answer for where we're at collectively, but also individually. So as a church, as a body of Christ... He's speaking here to Thyatira, and he says, first to the pastor, he says, you've tolerated, you've put up with, you've allowed, you've allowed 
that woman Jezebel. Now, now he uses the term Jezebel. That doesn't mean her name was Jezebel. It was literally like a reference back to Jezebel of the Old Testament. The Jezebel in dealing with Elijah. You remember that Jezebel. In the same way you might say, you might reference Judas. And everybody knows what Judas was rep represented. So if, if somebody rep it said, referenced Hitler, they would know what Hitler represented. They would know what Judas represented. Well, they knew what Jezebel represented. And he says, you've tolerated this woman, Jezebel. Now, something interesting, when you go back and look at it in the Greek that you really can't tell just from reading here, but in the Greek, it says it reads closer to, instead of this woman, it reads your woman. Your woman. As if to say, there's a possibility this could have been the pastor's wife. Could have been. It could have been. Literally someone that was close to him that he had allowed to speak in this manner. Now, he says she calls herself a prophetess. I want you to understand something. We recognize the, the, the gifts, all the gifts of the Spirit here. We believe fully in them. We believe in their operation, but we believe that there's an order to them. If someone that we know very well has a word for the church and we know where they stand with the Lord and we know that they're walking, then, then, then we allow them to bring that word. If someone stood their, up and raised their hand and said, I have a word for the church and I don't know them or we don't know them, we would immediately, one of our pastors would go over and say, can you share that with me because we don't know you. You know, so we don't just give a platform to anyone, but are there people with a gift of prophecy? Absolutely there are. And if they've heard from the Lord, do we want to hear that? Absolutely we do. Absolutely. But this woman calls herself a prophetess, and she had a word, but her word was pulling the church astray. But her word was allowed to be heard, and the pastor allowed it, and some of the people were following it. And her word took them to a place where they were practicing sexual immorality, where they were going back and, and referencing uh, food that had been offered to idols. The big thing, we could use the word compromise. They had compromised their beliefs because of what she had brought, those ideas, and it was as if to say, it could have been even, even been couched, because when he uses that term prophetess, it could have been couched as in a word of prophecy. I've got a word from the Lord for you. And then she gives this word, but that word's not from God at all. Instead, it's from the enemy of our soul. And it led them down a, a, a path that took them to a dark place. And there were people that were following her. Does Jesus have a problem with that? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Was that pastor responsible for that? Yes, he was. He couldn't get around it. But the responsibility didn't solely lie with the pastor. It also lay with the people that heard and followed. If there's one thing we've tried to teach you as we speak from, we don't really have a pulpit, but from this platform at More to Life, we want you to read God's word for yourself. We want you to understand God's Word. We want you to ask questions if you think that what we're preaching is not God's Word. We give you open opportunity. You can come knock on our door at any time. You're more than welcome to question, ask questions, because you need to measure everything back against Scripture to make sure that what you're hearing is truth. Amen? You agree with me? So that if someone was bringing a word that they said was from the Lord, like this Jezebel, you might go, hey, whoa, 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 that doesn't sound right. Wait a minute. That, that, something's not right with that. And you might bring a question to that. There was a responsibility that lay with those people also. Let's say it was the pastor's wife. Don't blindly follow her. Let's say it came from the pastor. Don't blindly follow him either. Follow Jesus. Amen? We want you to follow Jesus. We want you to worship Jesus. We want you to read his word, learn his word, know his word, study his word. Study his word. We want you to not accept any compromise in your life for anything. Now I want you to look at this. Jesus speaking of her, he, he says, she calls herself a prophetess. She's teaching and seducing 
what does he say? My servants. He's come after, she's come after my people. These are my people. These aren't lost people. These are my people. These are my servants, but they've been led astray. And some of them have followed. Some of them are, are headed in that direction. And while he's going to hold her responsible, he's also going to hold them responsible. You're not going to be able to say, well, you know what? Pastor Kerry said that, and he was wrong, Lord, so I'm covered. No, no. He, there is no getting out of responsibility to answer to Christ. We, we have that responsibility. I'm so thankful for his grace. We're a church that believes in his grace. But we're also a church that believes in pursuing him in purity, following after him in holiness, chasing after him and allowing him to cleanse us constantly, living a repentant life constantly. And Jesus is going to give her, this is amazing, this woman, this woman that has led God's servants astray, his people astray, that he says, I have a problem with immediately and speaks out. The first thing he says is, I gave her a chance to repent. Did everybody hear that? I gave her a chance to repent. How many of you are thankful for a chance to repent? Amen? Every one of us have had a chance to repent. Listen, sometimes he might give you a second, third, fourth, fifth chance to repent. Don't test him, though. Don't keep running back. He gave her a chance to repent. She refused. She, repu she refused. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed. Does God do that? What do you mean throw her onto a sick bed? Keep, keep, I didn't give you this one, TJ. It's okay. Keep a finger right there and turn back over with me to 1 Corinthians 11. Real quick. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27, Paul's, Paul's given some instruction to the church at Corinth, and he's given instruction about the Lord's Supper in this particular uh, portion. And they, they've been coming to the table, and they've been gorging themselves and, 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 and drinking way too much. And there, there was no honor for the table. There was no honor for what God had asked him to do in, reverence to, in, in reference to the Lord's Supper. And in verse 27, he says, Whoever therefore eats of the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Paul's given some rebuke to him about it. He says, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. What? Did he just say that? Yes, he did. That's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we're judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Listen, God's not above bringing his people back under his discipline. And sin will bring about sickness in our life. It can that doesn't mean because if you had a cold, it was because you had sin in your life yesterday. But the result of sin, it eats away at the body. And there's times when a prolonged illness or a prolonged sickness has direct, it's directly because of, of something that we've been struggling with sin-wise. Particularly unforgiveness is one of those sins that, that everybody seems to make a treaty with and they think it's okay to hang on to unforgiveness in their life and they don't realize that it's eating away at the inside of them. It's tearing at their soul. It literally is. It literally is. And, and, and a physical illness can come from that just because of the spiritual side of things that they're dealing with. James chapter 5 talks about it. Talk about uh, the, the, uh, as he refers to the prayer offered up in faith. And, and the fact that he says, confess your sins one to, another, one to another, that there might be healing take place. So when he says, when Jesus himself says in Revelation 2 that I'm going to bring a layer onto a sick bed and that those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation. Listen, he's not just talking about a physical adultery, he's talking about a spiritual adultery. A spiritual adultery. It's one thing to, to follow in sexual immorality, which was part of what was going on here, 
But more so, more so, they had turned their back on God to follow the ways of the world. They had reached the point where they had made a treaty with things and, and, and they were okay. Listen, one of the, the Lord showed me some extra things this morning to this, and, and, and part of it was I've been reading in the Old Testament during just my normal, my, my reading in the morning, and I've been working through uh, 1 Kings right now. I'm in 1 Kings, and, and as I looked at it, you see this cycle as you read back through 1 Kings and 2 Kings and go into Chronicles and they repeat it and talk a little bit more about the kings and you know there's the division of the kingdom after David dies and then Solomon becomes king and then after Solomon dies that, that his, with his kids things get split up and all of a sudden the kingdom split in two and there's Israel and there's Judah and there's a king over each one and you see this pattern repeat itself again and again you see a, a king that serves the Lord and then you see a king that doesn't serve the Lord. And sometimes they'll go three or four kings in a row without serving the Lord. And then one will come back to the Lord and they'll repent and they'll go through this cycle. And it happened again and again. And one of the things that jumped out at me, and I'm not going to go back there and read them, but back in 1 Kings chapter 15, I think it was, he talks about King Asa initially. And King Asa, as he came into power over Judah, one of the things that King Asa did was he did some great stuff. It said he followed hard after the Lord. He, he tore down some of the altars. He, he, got rid of his, he got rid of his own mom. He took her out as far as, as for many power because she, was, she had built an a, a, a idol unto Asherah, and then he tore that thing down because his mom wasn't following the Lord. So he did some great things, but then it says one little blurb. It said, he left the high places. He left the high places. What are the high places? The high places were places where they went to worship foreign gods. And it was some of those kings, you see them tear down the high places, and with others you see them, but they left the high places alone. In other words, I didn't burn all the ships, I kept one. I got rid of a bunch of the stuff, but I've still got this part. So after King Asa comes Jehoshaphat, his son, and you know what he did? He left the high places alone again. He followed after the Lord. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but he left the high places. So after that came Jehoram, the next generation. You know what he did? He didn't follow after the Lord at all. He rebuilt all those bad spots. Listen, if you think that your sin does not affect your children and your grandchildren, you're wrong. If you think that your sin is yours alone and it has no effect to the next generation or the generation after that, you're wrong. Generational sin is real. But so are generational blessings, praise God. So is His grace that's extended to us and, and, and washes us clean, praise God. But I have to take responsibility for my stuff and deal with all of it. What happens, it, it, the, the thing that the Lord showed me this morning as I, as I just look back over those passages, praying about what he wanted me to say today. The thing that he showed me this morning is as a church, and I'm not just talking about it more to life, I'm talking about a church in America, the church, uh, the church of Christ uh, across America specifically, which isn't the only church, by the way, the church of God is worldwide, amen? But here in America, one of the things we, we've done is we've left the high places. Both as a church and in, in, as individuals, we've left the high places. We may have gotten rid of some of this big stuff, I may have cleaned up this part of my life, but if you open up this cabinet, you'll see some of the old stuff still. Maybe I got rid of all of this and I don't have those channels anymore, but, you know, on my computer occasionally this little thing pops up. Maybe I'm not dealing with that things anymore. Maybe, I, maybe I'm, I'm past that, but occasionally I, 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 I watch this show. And listen, I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not. I'm talking about the Lord dealing with you in such a way that you get rid of anything remotely questionable in your life that's going to keep you from Him. Because, folks, we don't have long. We don't have long. What if it's tomorrow? 
What if it's today? What if this afternoon the Lord came back? How would he find your house? By your house, I'm meaning your heart. What condition would he find it in? What's in your home that you've told your children is okay? I'm just asking. I'm just asking. That's what he told me to ask this morning. And listen, I, I've had to go through my house because there's things that we had okayed by our actions before and we've had to go through and say, Lord, please forgive us. Tear them down. Tear them down. What you do in moderation, your children will do in excess. What you tolerate in your home, they'll blow wide open. What you allow, what you've made a treaty with and said it's okay, by the time your kids or your grandkids get there, there won't even be a hint of what God wants in their life. Am I trying to scare you? I'm preaching truth straight out of his word to you and to me. I'm not preaching down to you, but to me. The Lord has spoken all of that to me lately once again, to go back through my house once again, to tear down any high places that I've left alone, anything that I've made a treaty with that I've said is okay. Because while it might be okay in your mind for you. Can you picture your grandson or granddaughter doing that same thing? Can you? Because they'll do it far worse. They will. They will. Back to Revelation 2. He says, unless they repent of her works, that's us. Unless, unless those, who are fall, those who have fallen, those who have made a treaty with sin, those who still have high places in their life, things that the Lord told them to get rid of and they only got rid of part of it. Before I go back there, just like, I feel like I'm supposed to say this. Some, I, we don't talk a lot about soul ties here but, uh, it, from the pulpit, but we believe in, in, in what a soul tie is is a connection at the soul that two people may have. They, they've had an interaction in a sinful way, sometimes it could be a soul tie in a good way, but it's a connection to the soul, mind, will, and emotions connected with another person. And sometimes people have had from their past soul ties with other individuals, and they may have broken those, they may not see those individuals anymore, praise God for that, but in your house you still have reminders. You have stuff they've given you. stuff they bought you, things, well, I just keep that, it really doesn't mean anything. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. I don't know why I'm supposed to say that, but the Lord, that, that, that's for somebody today. Get rid of it. Unless they repent. Of her works, I will strike her children dead. Now, literally, he does, he's not talking about her birth children. He's talking about her followers, all who would follow after her, anyone who's made a determination to follow after her. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. I'm he who sees everything. I'm he who searches not only the mind, but the feelings and the emotions of the heart. I see all of it, and I'll give to each of you as your works deserve. Now, you might read that, little last, that last little statement and think, man, that sounds good. Give, give to us as our works deserve. Listen, I don't want God to give me what my works deserve, and neither do you. <laughs> we want his grace. We want his mercy. But to those who are strictly relying on that, to those who will not repent, they'll get as their works deserve. And that won't be a good thing. It will not be a good thing. We're almost, I'm bringing it to a close. We're almost done. But for the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Burden. 
He says, to the rest of you who have held fast, to the rest of you who've not fallen what she said, following what she said, who've held to my teachings, you've not followed or learned what's called the deep things of Satan, and, and, and that's, that's part of, it was part of the lie that she was bringing. Sometimes, and I've heard it today sometimes, let me just give you this little commercial real quick, okay? In our spiritual warfare is real, Satan's very real, he is very real. He's more powerful than you. He's not more powerful than God, praise God. We have the Holy Spirit and we're armed with the Holy Spirit, praise God. But on my own, in my flesh, he will overtake me and I will lose every time. Every time. Some would tell you that in the fighting the battle against Satan, you got to learn all about your enemy. I think that's what she was telling him right here. Listen, you don't have to learn all about your enemy. You have to learn all about your champion. Jesus is your champion. This is how we fight our battles. He fights for us. I need to run to him and let him fight for me. I don't need to study Satan. I don't need to learn about his, his ways. He's a liar. He's a thief. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus Christ has come to bring life. And he fights for us. Amen? He fights for us. So we run to him. He goes before us. He goes before us. So he says to those who've not followed after that, he said, only hold fast to what you have until I come. Hold on. Now, let me just say this. To those who've not bowed to Jezebel, were these a perfect people? No. He's not saying to the ones of you who've not sinned yet, those people don't exist. There's only one without sin, and that's Jesus Christ. So these weren't a, purple, a perfect people he was talking to. They were just a people that had determined they were going to hold on. How about we be that, huh? Let's be a people that are going to hold on to him, that are going to hold on to his word, that are going to continue to pursue him, are going to listen to him, they're going to listen to the Holy Spirit in our life. We're going to study it enough so that we know the fake when it comes at us, so that we don't fall into those ways. We're going to get rid of the things that keep drawing us away. We're going to clean house. Some of us need to clean house physically and spiritually. Go home and get rid of some stuff that keeps drawing you back. I thought I got rid of that. Well, no, you really didn't. You just put it in a sh on a shelf or you just put it in a box and put it in the attic. But every once in a while, you drag it out and pet it. Look at it again. And God said, get rid of it. He wants you to get rid of it. He says to those people, the ones that will hold on, the ones that will hold fast, they're going to rule and reign with me. It's what he tells them. They're going to rule and reign alongside of me. Praise God. Do you know that's what awaits us as believers? That we're going to rule with him? Not on some power trip. <laughs> we'll just be glad to be there along his side. He, he's the king. But we'll rule and reign with him. We're on the winning side. It doesn't look like it right now. It doesn't look like it. But we're on the winning team if we're on his team. He says, to them I'll give the morning star. Who is the morning star? Jesus, to them they get me, to those who will overcome, to those who will hold on and hold fast till the end, they get me, not me carry, him Jesus, praise God, praise God. I didn't mean for that to sound hard if it sounded hard this morning, but it's what the Lord told me to share. And as I look back and, and, and think about the extra stuff that he, he gave me that it, I knew, I didn't get to everything in, on the church of Thyatira, but I knew he wanted me to talk about those high places. And I also know that he wanted me to address getting rid of stuff that you're still holding on to. And I don't know what that is for you. I don't know what that looks like. But listen to me, hear me carefully. If you ask him, he will show you in bright color. You'll know it immediately. If you ask him, 
Lord, show me anything that I've kept back that leads me back to my old life. Anything that causes me to go astray from you. Anything that I might have made a compromise with and deemed okay in my life when it's not okay to you. And, and here's part of the Christian life. As we mature as believers and we're going to continue to be on that process the rest of our days until he comes back, amen? None of us have arrived. But as, as we continue down that process, he shows us more. So that things that you might fall under conviction of today, you might not have felt under conviction at all two years ago or three years ago or maybe last week, but all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says it's time for that to go. I love you and, and, and it's time that you, you, for that to go, for you to give that to me. But, it, but, but Lord, what about him? He's, he's got one. I don't care about him. Not that I don't care about him. It, I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. For you, it's time for that to go. But, but Lord, what about that freedom thing? Well, it's not free for you. Well, I don't know about that. Well, listen, are you with the Holy Spirit? Talk with the Lord. He'll, he'll, he wins that argument every time if you listen to him. I'm, I'm not, the pastor doesn't bring conviction, the Holy Spirit brings conviction, amen? Amen. But I know this, I know this today. As a church, as a church, when God looks at More to Life Ministries. He's going to have some good things to say. But I guarantee you we're going to hear, but I have this against you. What will follow after that? I don't know. It could be a number of things. But as a church, we want to be diligent in making sure that we're in pursuit of him, listening to him. He gave her opportunity to repent. He gave them opportunity to repent. That's his mercy. He's extending mercy to us this morning with opportunity to repent. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would. If you bow your heads, I thank you for staying with me. I know it's been warm in here, but also know that this part is very important. If you bow your heads, close your eyes, nobody looking around. I want you to ask him right now. Lord, is there any high place I need to tear down? Lord, is there anything that I need to get rid of? Is there anything that's still tying my soul to my past? Anything that keeps drawing me back, pulling me back? causing me to stumble, causing me to compromise. What is it, Lord? Show me. Just ask him right now. Nobody looking around, heads bowed still. If you got something that you need to give him. And for some of us, it may just be in our mind. It may just be a battle that we fought, things that we keep hanging on to, an old lie that we keep believing. If you got something you need to give him and you want to give him, I just want you to lift your hand to him right now. Just lift your hand to him. So, Lord, I want to give you this. I want to give you this. Take it from me today. Tear down the high places in my home, Lord. Tear down the high places in my heart. Lord, I repent of the areas that I've compromised in. The places, Lord, where I've committed spiritual adultery against you where I've walked away, Lord, chased after another, served a God of my own making instead of the one true God. Cleanse me, Father. 
Wash me clean today. Thank you for your amazing grace that allows me to stand. Thank you, Lord, that you set me free. Head still bowed and no one looking around. You can put your hands down now. If you're here today and you don't know him, and I know I didn't really preach a salvation message, but if you don't know Christ, he loves you and he died for you and he asks you for your life. Literally, he, he does. It's, he gives you a free gift of salvation, but it's going to cost you everything. He asks you to give him you. But I promise you this, in him there's life and outside of him there is no life. So today, if you don't know him, but you'd like to, I'd love to pray with you. Other people here would love to pray with you. If you don't know him, but you'd like to, if you just lift a hand, we're going to close in one moment. If you just lift a hand, we'd love to talk with you about how you can come to know the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you for today. Thank you for your... Lord, your faithfulness, we bless your name, Lord. Amen. Don't put everything away yet. If you would, if you take those baskets and pass them to the outside, someone will pick them up. Samantha's going to lead us in one verse here of this song, and then we'll close together. much that you pursue us, Lord. Thank you for how you love us, Father. Lord, we want to be a repentant people that follows hard after you. Thank you for the truth of your word. We bless your name today, Lord. We thank you. In your mighty name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Y'all help us clean this place up. We appreciate it.